Ministry Awareness Now, Brother Stephen Wynn. You may be seated. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Nice to see all your bright, shining faces today. How many of you have a boss? No. <laughs> we have a heavenly boss, yes, for sure. Now, I'm not talking about your spouse, but uh, that might be, that might work. Can you really get to know your boss by simply doing what your boss tells you to do? If you work in an office, your boss may say, make 200 copies of this, collate it, staple it, have it on my desk by 3 p.m. I'll do that. I'll do what you command me to do. Yeah. If you really want to get to know your boss as a person, you have to sit down with your boss and you need to find out one thing. What does your boss really want in life? Not what your boss requires, not what your boss commands, not what your boss expects, but what your boss wants. And the most powerful principle that God has revealed to me in my life is the fact that he wants something. And he wants this so badly that he sent all of heaven, his only begotten son, the most precious being in all the universe to him. He gave me his son so that he, the father, could get what he wants. You know, in John 14, it, Jesus said that, he said, I will pray the Father, and he will send you, he, the, the Father, will send you another comforter so that he, the Father, may be with you forever. That, that he there, I always thought of the, as the Holy Spirit, you know, someone separate from the Father and separate from Jesus. But no, it's the Father who wants to be with us forever. That's why he's sending us his Spirit through his Son. And so God has this, this great desire. In uh, Ezekiel 36, that is my favorite chapter in the Bible because that formed my conversion. Even though I was raised as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, born and raised, I wasn't converted until my early 20s, when I realized what God really wants. And in Ezekiel 36, he, he talks about how he scattered his people because they defiled his holy name. And at first, being a little arrogant, you know, he was saying, I must defend my holy name. And he says that several times. And I, I remember thinking, well, God, are you arrogant? Why do you insist on defending your holy name? And then I realized through a series of events in my life that God truly is great. And he says I must defend my holy name because we actually depend on his name for life. The Father is the source of all life. The reason you and I are breathing right now is because our Father wants something. He's giving you every breath that you're taking. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. You're depending. I'm depending on the name of He is our only source of life. And if I, lose, if I lose sight of where my, my life comes from, then I'm going to lose my life. I'm not going to appreciate my life. And so God wants something. And in that chapter of Ezekiel 36, I also discovered how much God wants what he wants. You know, he says in verse 24 that I will gather you out of all lands whereof I have sent you. And in the Old Testament, the word land represents relationship. You know, God promised a land for his people. 
And we, when we think of the promised land, we think of it many times as a symbol of heaven. When the children of Israel entered into the promised land, they had to fight battle after battle after battle. And when we enter the promised land of heaven, we're not going to be fighting battles anymore. Praise God. And so the promised land, in my mind, it, it refers to more than just heavenly Canaan. It refers to the intimate relationship that God wants to have with me. That's what God wants from me. And so when he says, I will gather you and bring you into your own land, that's the first step in God getting what he really wants. You know, when you take your car to the mechanic, the first thing the, the, that the mechanic does, he doesn't just start working on your car. He either has a pit that he goes down into and looks at your car, or he has a lift that he raises it up on so he can have access to looking at your car. So that's kind of what God is doing when he brings us into our own land. He's putting us up on the lift where he can have access to us. And then we see um, a, a series of things that God does there in Ezekiel 36. He brings us into our own land. He, he puts clean water on us and cleanses us. He gives us a new heart. He gives us a new spirit. He puts his spirit within us, and he causes us to walk in his statutes. And we do his statutes, but that's not the first thing. The only reason we can do his statutes and keep his commandments and do what he commands us is because he has already put us up on the lift. He's brought us back into our own land, into relationship with him. And it just, it, in, in Ezekiel 36, it just really was so powerful to me that this great God, on, upon whom I depend for my very life, wants to spend eternity with me. He really craves that. And I remember, you know, when my life was a total mess, I was depressed, I was de addicted, I was full of fear. But yet here this great God just craved being with me. And that just, wow, I, I cannot describe that. Because no one here on this earth wanted to be with me. My life was a mess. I didn't even like my own self. <laughs> I didn't like being with myself. But here God absolutely loved to be with me. His great desire is to be with me, to be together with me. And when we have the, with the presence of God, which is the Holy Spirit, with us, then he begins to change our lives. He begins to change what we want. And then he begins to change what we do. God's great desire. And so I began to, after this experience, I began to look at the life of Christ and to see how he expressed his father's great desire. And Jesus went around connecting with individuals. And I use the word connecting very specifically. When Jesus did personal ministry, First of all, it wasn't, he didn't have his life and then his ministry over here. His life was his ministry. And so I want to encourage us as we talk about personal ministry this morning that our life is our ministry. We don't live our life and then say, okay, let's go do ministry now. <laughs> We're always doing ministry. But Jesus went around and he really looked at people. And we're going to look at that in my, uh, in my group at 1130. But when Jesus looked at someone, it was a powerful thing. It wasn't just light bouncing off the receptacles in his eyes. It was, it was a powerful thing to look at someone, to make that eye contact. Imagine Jesus looking at you. What a beautiful thought. But Jesus connected with people and a big part of that was eye contact that he made with people. And then he really listened to people. You know, many times when we listen to someone sharing their problems with us, 
we are trying to think of the next thing we're going to say. We're not really listening. We've got to listen actively. But we'll talk more about that. So I was really overwhelmed with his conviction of what God really wants. And that that is really the meaning of life. God getting what he wants. That's the, the starting point, the foundation. And so I was impressed to, um, I, was, I was on Facebook one day, and I, a, a friend of mine who I had gone to seminary with, I didn't finish seminary, but I, I started it. <laughs> that was another story, another miracle. But um, my friend who I had gone to seminary with was really sharing some depressing things on Facebook. You, you could tell he was just really very depressed. And I private messaged him and I said, here's my phone number. Give me a call, please. Let's talk. And I never heard from him. And I tried several times and I never heard from him. So I knew where he lived. And so I drove from Denver to Southern California. And when I got into his town, to, into his, uh, town I was able to contact him. And I said, where do you want to meet? I'm in town. Let's meet. And I had no idea what was really going on in his life. He was, he was a pastor. And um, we met at a Starbucks. And I remember getting a, a peppermint tea. And I remember sliding that brown uh, wrapper up and down as I just listened to him. And he had had an affair. And he had lost his job as a pastor. And he was super depressed. He wasn't even sure if God exists and I just listened. And you know, that is so difficult to do, <laughs> to just listen to someone. Because we want to fix their problem. We want to say, here's what you need to do to fix your problem. Then we can walk away. And it's mission accomplished. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus listened to people. He connected with people. And, and I realized that Jesus, in his personal ministry, he was accomplishing what the father really wants the father wants to be with us forever to connect with us forever and um as as we finished our conversation that night and we walked out into the parking lot i asked him i said what can i do for you how can i help you and i'll never forget what he said he said just be there And it sounded so simple, but I'm still trying to comprehend what that really means. Just be there. Just be there. That is connecting, and that's God's great desire. To just be there for us, and for us to just be there for one another. There is power in just being there with someone. Not solving the problem. Just letting God do what he wants to do through you. Letting that person know that, hey, I am here, and I'm not going anywhere. That gives the person hope. That gives the person value. And that's what people are missing today so much. So God placed it on my heart to start a ministry called God's Great Desire Ministries. And uh, feel free to check us out on YouTube, God's Great Desire Ministries. But just practicing what God really wants, to connect with us and for, and for us to connect with one another. Thank you. That makes me remember the Bible says that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So praise